CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall, bellwether of a fantastic flock that forms on these airwaves at this time and place. The presentiment of danger, the intimation of disaster, the uneasy, inexplicable feeling that something we cannot define is leading us into a catastrophe we cannot explain for a reason we cannot understand. A fragment of a dream that vanishes upon awakening. A wisp of an idea that eludes our comprehension and escapes our memory. Is this the way fate seems to warn us of our mortal peril? If so, it is like the warning of the rattlesnake. Too little and too late. You will soon commit murder, Lord Arthur. This is monstrous. I have absolutely no intention. Look, I'm not a murderer. Oh, no one is until he kills for the first time. I tell you, I cannot commit murder. And I tell you, you can. And you will. I refuse to believe it. Ah, you're all alike. You all want to pry into your future, which you have no business doing. And when you see what fate has in store for you, you refuse to believe it. But murder? Yes, Murder. What's so special about murder? People do it every day. Our mystery drama, The Saxon Curse, is based on the Oscar Wilde classic and was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Today, things are tough all over. Even the very rich complain. They protest their wealth is being eaten away by ruinous taxes. They lament that their once sacrosanct watering places have been invaded by common folk. And most of all, they bemoan the fact that it's virtually impossible to find a decent servant. They may have a point. Quite possibly, they may have been born at the wrong time. They should have lived, say, in England around 1905, when rank had its privileges, wealth had its license, and the common people knew their place. Our hero is the youthful Lord Arthur Savile, a golden boy who lives in a golden time. Well, well, you naughty fellow. Why haven't you been to see me all this time? Dear Aunt Clem, I never have a moment to myself. That's because you spend all your time with Sybil Merton. I cannot understand why people make such a fuss over getting married. I assure you, I have not seen Sybil for 24 hours. As far as I can make out, she belongs entirely to her milliners. How are you feeling? Dear boy, as you well know, doctors are of no use at all. They can't even cure my headache. Unfortunately, these wretched headaches seem to run in the family. You know the legend. There's an old Saxon curse leveled against one of our ancient Norman ancestors. Poppycock. You must come into the drawing room. I have a most interesting company. Oh, I didn't know you were engaged. Well, you needn't try to fit me in. I have Sir Matthew and Lady Reed. Sir Matthew Reed? He's the president of the Royal College of Physicians. Elected by mistake, I was told. But surely so distinguished a physician could come up with a cure for your headache. The more distinguished the physician, the more elevated the fee. And, of course, you must meet Professor Septimus Podgers. Professor Septimus Rogers? Podgers. Well, now, who is... Prof you haven't heard of Septimus Podgers? But everyone knows Septimus. Except me. Uh, Professor Podgers is a celebrated chiromantist. What is a chiromantist? One who reads hands. Oh, a gypsy. Professor Podgers is a man of science. Oh, really? I must introduce you. He tells fortunes, I suppose. And misfortunes, too. 
next year, for instance, I am in great danger. It's all written on my little finger. Oh, the palm of my hand. I forget which. But aren't you tempting Providence, Aunt Chloe? My dear Arthur, surely Providence can resist temptation by this time. Now come. You must come in and meet my remarkable Mr. Podgers. And so I entered my aunt's drawing room, where I was introduced to her Mr. Podgers. I must say there was nothing esoteric or mysterious or romantic-looking about him at all. He was a stout little man with a funny bald head, and you might take him for something between a family doctor and a country solicitor. He was staring at the palm of Sir Matthew, and I was amazed to see how Sir Matthew and Lady Reed gazed at him with rapt attention. And what do you claim to see in my hand, sir? I see a man of adventurous nature. You have taken four long voyages in the past. By George, so I have. You were shipwrecked once. Amazing. You you have a passion for collecting curiosities. But everyone knows that. It's been in the paper. Arthur, dear boy, do not interrupt. I see in this line, the health line, a secret. Sir Matthew, you had a serious illness between the ages of 16 and 18. Now, how the devil would you know? Well, it's all written here. Extraordinary. The man is uncanny. And now, Professor Podgers, my nephew, Lord Arthur Saville, is anxious to have his palm read. Uh, no, no, I'm not exactly... Oh, no, have him do it, Arthur. It's like someone opening a window in your mind. I'm not sure those windows shouldn't remain closed. Hmm. Perhaps the boy's afraid. Oh, I'm not afraid. Professor, as you can see, young Lord Saville is dying to have his hand read. Don't tell him he's engaged to the most beautiful girl in London. Because that news has already been published in the morning punch. May I examine your right hand, Lord Arthur? Well, if you insist. He touched my hand, and it was as if a galvanic current ran through my body. Something happened. I don't know what, but I do know this. Suddenly, he no longer seemed to be a somewhat ludicrous, fat little man. I felt I was in the presence of great power, authority. A shudder passed through me, and I was frightened to see that the shudder also passed through him. Beads of perspiration broke out on his bald skull like a poisonous dew, and his fat, sausage-like fingers grew cold and clammy. And I knew fear, real fear, for the first time in my life. My impulse was to run from the room, but I forced myself to stand still. I am waiting, Professor. Well, what do you see in my hand? I... I see the hand of, of a charming young man. Within the next few months, Lord Arthur will go on a voyage. Naturally, his honeymoon. And lose a relative. <laughs> well, we all lose relatives. Sometimes I think they were created for the purpose. Can you tell us any more? Uh, no, Lady Clementine. Uh, that's all I can see. I was furious with myself. What was this feeling of terror that had suddenly come over me? Why had I permitted myself to be frightened by some unwholesome charlatan? But was he a charlatan? Is it possible that written on my hand is some fearful secret of sin, some blood-red sign of crime? Is he gifted with a power to read it? Why do I feel now that some tragedy hangs over me? I waited for a chance to take the man aside for a moment. What is it, Lord Arthur? I must insist on your giving me a straightforward answer to my question. What makes you think I saw anything in your hand, Lord Arthur? I know you did. I, I, I'm afraid you're mistaken. All right, how much do you want? I saw nothing. How much do you want? How much do I want? This is how you earn your living, isn't it? Professor Podgers, I want... Oh, please, Lord Arthur. Lady Clementine will be quite angry with me if I keep her... Whatever it is you saw, Professor, I have a right to know. But I did I'll give you 50 pounds. Yes, sir, I... I 100, 100 pounds. Now, listen, where can we discuss this? I, uh... You may find me at 30 West Moon Street. My hours are from 10 to 4. 
What was wrong with me? Wasn't it obvious who he was? A preposterous trickster, a ridiculous quack. Yes, yes, it was obvious. But it didn't matter. Because he was an instrument designed to pierce through the fog of the unknown and reveal my destiny. What had he seen in my hand? I need not tell you there was no sleep for me that night. Promptly at ten, I presented myself at 30 West Moon Street. A thoroughly unimpressive house in a completely nondescript neighborhood. The professor himself looked even shabbier in the daylight. He took my hand in both of his, and once again that same electric shock charged through my body and through his body, too. His eyes closed. His teeth seemed to chatter. Suddenly he dropped my hand. Murder. What? Murder. I see murder. What do you mean, murder? Am, am I going to be murdered? No. You will be the murderer. Now, see here, Professor. Have you asked this, me... This is... This is... This is what? This is monstrous. Murder? murder? I'm not a murderer. Oh, no one is until he kills. Now, how can you sit there and tell me such... Such, such what? It's the truth. I'm not the kind of person who... Why who... didn't you leave it alone? I tried to discourage you. I tell you, I cannot commit murder. And I tell you that you can and you will. Who am I going to kill? I don't know. Your murder line stopped short. Well, will I kill more than once? No. There is only one murder in your head. And will I be caught? No. How can you be sure? Because I see no line of retribution in your head. Then, then I'm to get away with it. Yes. Because you will obviously have chosen your victim carefully and planned your murder skillfully... And executed your killing flawlessly. Carefully, skillfully, flawlessly. How? What do I know about murder? Oh, you will learn. After all, Lord Arthur, necessity has always been the mother of invention. Than which truer words were never spoken. Of course, to our hero, Lord Arthur Savile, murder was something that usually took place only in the sensational newspapers. It was neither the pastime nor the preoccupation of a gentleman. But now, suddenly, he himself is notified that he is not only about to commit murder, but he is to do it successfully. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Murder will out, said Chaucer. Murder cannot be hid, said Cervantes. And murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ, said Shakespeare. That is certainly a weighty consensus of extremely well-informed opinion. And yet, here we have young Lord Arthur Savile being cast by destiny in the role of a murderer who will not only murder, but remain undetected. But why, Professor Podgers, why am I about to commit murder? That I cannot say. I have no enemies. No one hates me. Why? There must be a reason. I'm sorry, Sir Arthur. I can enlighten you no further. Now, wait. You saw three things in my hand, hmm? Two of them you told me last night. First, that I would go on a voyage. Do you still see that? Yes. Second, that I shall lose a relative. Is that still to occur? Yes. And that I shall commit murder. Well, does that complete the list? It does, Sir Arthur. Yes. And how many relatives am I to lose? Just one. Just one? Quite so, sir. But I, I only have two relatives. Two? In all the world. There is just my twin sister, Pamela, and my aunt, Lady Clementine Beecham. Are you saying that that one of them will die within the next few months? I am saying that is what is written. Well, which one? I, I'm sorry it doesn't say. But one will die. Yes, Lord Arthur. I looked at my hand. 
And suddenly, it was no longer the familiar five-fingered palm made of firm pink flesh and finely etched delicate lines. It was white, dead white, corpse white, like the white paper on which the death sentence is written. And here, the death sentence was written in blood-red letters. Lady Clementine Beecham. And I even knew why. She would die because it would be necessary to make sure that my sister, my dearest twin, Pamela, would live. And at that moment, I felt almost at peace, almost as if I were serving the ends of a just fate. For why should Pamela, lovely Pamela, newly married and about to know the joys of motherhood, die? Why shouldn't I make sure of her love? Aunt Claire. Surely a woman of 80 could have no complaints. I was able to smile. I was even able to assume a pose with Professor Podgers. Professor, I believe I owe you a hundred pounds. May I write you a check? If it's convenient, Lord Arthur. Oh, here we are. Paid to the order of Septimus Podger and so forth. A hundred pounds is cheap enough for such capital amusement. Amusement? Yes, and quite ingenious. I enjoyed every moment of it. But I assure you, Lord Arthur, what I saw in your hand is, is the absolute truth. <laughs> yes, I dare say. Remarkably good show. I trust you're available for future entertainments, uh, parties and so forth? I am always at your lordship's service. And so I was committed to the killing of my Aunt Clem. But how to go about it? Direct physical violence was out of the question. I simply could not see myself assaulting my aunt. I would feel like a fool. That left one way. Poison. But what did I know about poisons? Nothing. Ah, but Sir Matthew Reed, the famous physician, was a family friend, a member of my club. He lunched there daily, as I did. It would be a simple matter to join him. I say, Arthur, that cop seems a bit underdone. <laughs> well, it's what comes of having a French chef. Yes, joining him for lunch was no problem. But how could I get him to talk about poisons? It was hardly a luncheon topic. But imagine my amazement when suddenly, after his second glass of port... Speaking of poisons, Arthur... Uh, what? I, <laughs> I, I wasn't aware that we were speaking of poisons, Sir Matthew. Well, I was thinking of poisons, so it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Remarkable case in the newspapers. I read about it? Uh, no, sir. Hmm. did away with his wife. Uh, yes, sir. Botched it. Hmm, is that so? Chap was married 50 years, fell in love with a younger woman, had to get rid of the old one. <laughs> Bounder deserves to be hanged. For murdering his wife, sir? No, for using arsenic. Ah. Messy, painful affair. Now... After 50 years of loyal service, the poor old lady deserved something like, well, a conatine. A conatine, sir? Oh, yes. It's the creme de la creme of poison. Swift. Takes almost immediate effect. Perfectly painless. It mixes well with food and drink. Quite palatable. Is that so? Arthur, you must promise me something. If after 50 years of wedded bliss with a divine sibyl, you should decide to, well, do her in, you should by all means use a conatine. I promise. Uh, Sir Matthew, suppose after 50 years I should wish to make a fool of myself, uh, how could I come upon this uh, conatine? Why, uh, I expect there shall always be a humbies and pestle. They should still be chemists by appointment to whomever the future monarch will be. Humbies and pestle, of course. Yes, it was going along beautifully. It was as if I were following a track leading me to my sure destination. That afternoon, I strolled up St. James Street to Humby and Pestle's. Mr. Pestle, who always attended personally on the aristocracy, was a good deal surprised at the mention of the word aconitine, and in his usual deferential manner, started to mumble something about... Uh, uh, I assume, of course, Sir Arthur, that you have uh, 
prescription. I beg your pardon, Mr. Petal. Uh, the law requires... Oh, I, I hope you are not assuming that I intend something illegal. No, 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 no. It's, uh... You see, it's for an absolutely humanitarian purpose. I have this uh, huge Norwegian Mastiff. Uh, you're familiar with the breed, of course. I believe so. Yes, I am obliged to get rid of it since it insists on biting my Swedish chauffeur. The Norwegian Mastiff and the Swedish chauffeur seem to be sworn foes. There is no possibility of a peaceful solution. It's tragic. Uh, yes, sir. Since Norwegian Mastiffs are plentiful, whereas Swedish chauffeurs are rare indeed... Uh, I think I understand, Lord Arthur. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pessel. Uh, powder form is best, and a pinch in the dog's lunch or beverage. Ah, you are a man of great heart and understanding. <laughs> Always at your service, my lord. And may I compliment you on your remarkable knowledge of toxicology. Was it only last night that I had met Septimus Podgers for the first time? Was it only this morning that he revealed the awful secret of my hand? Was it only this noon that I had lunch with Sir Matthew and discovered the Econotime? And has it been only ten minutes since I walked out of Humby and Pestles with a poison in my pocket. Yes. What did Podgers say? I would execute this murder carefully, skillfully, flawlessly. Now, let me see. How shall I administer the Arconatine to dear Aunt Clem? This could be a sticky business, and the entire project could thunder. But it was remarkable how clearly I was thinking... How I was suddenly seized by the most happy inspiration. Why haven't you been to see me all this time? Dear Aunt Clem, I was here last night. The likely story. You take advantage of my failing memory. How are your headaches, dear Aunt Clem? I would rather not discuss the wretched things. I have brought you a cure for your headaches. There is no cure, dear boy. It's an ancient Saxon curse. No, but you must try this cure, dear Aunt Clem. It's proof against Saxon curses. Why do you say that? Because it was invented by an American. I assure you, it's a perfect cure. You must promise to try it. It comes in this... This little box. The box is charming, Arthur. It's made of silver. Open the box. Uh, carefully. It contains a powder. Uh, take a pinch in a little bit of wine. Well, try it right now. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> no, no, no. You must do nothing of the kind. You see, this is a uh, homeopathic medicine. Uh, if you take it without having a headache, it may do you no end of harm. Uh, wait till you have one and then try it. You will be astonished at the result. Oh, I should like to take it now. The fact is, though I despise doctors, I adore medicines. However, I shall wait for my next headache. Oh, when shall that be? Well, I hope not for a week. I never know. But you're sure to have one soon. Oh, how sympathetic you are today, Arthur. Really, Sybil has done you a great deal of good. But now you must run away. I am dining with some frightfully dull people. If I don't get my sleep now, I shall never be able to keep awake during dinner. Well, goodbye, dear aunt. Goodbye. Bye, dear boy, and thank you so much for the American medicine. Give my love to Sybil. Sybil. I must talk to Sybil. Since I should like to be as far away as possible when... when it happens. Of course. That's the voyage Podger saw in my hand. I must take my leave of Sybil. But it's a month before the wedding. What excuse can I make? My dearest, I... I have a confession to make. A confession? Oh, no, is it... Is, is it something serious? Oh, yes, it must be serious, else why would it be a confession? I am willing to release you from your vow. Oh, oh, this is... This is... I most... have not told you everything. You haven't told me everything? What have you withheld? My dearest, I am a victim. A victim? A victim of fate? Of circumstance? Neither. I am a victim of severe headaches. Headaches? Oh, you poor boy. It runs in the family. My aunt Clementine... Oh, I know, I know. She told me. 
There's an ancient Saxon curse. And so you see, since you were unaware... No, I love you despite your headaches. I accept you for what you are. Yes, but... But I must take my leave of you, my darling. Your leave? You're going? You're leaving? You... You... You will desert me? Uh, I'm going to Vienna. Vienna? But nobody ever goes to Vienna. There is, in Vienna, a celebrated doctor. A headache doctor? Well, a head doctor. Marvelous. And you're going to see him? No, surely he can cure my headache. Oh, my darling. Go. Go to him. Fly to him. You... You would not mind being neglected for ten days, fortnight, perhaps a month. My dearest, I have so many things to do to prepare for the wedding. I shan't even know you are gone. There you are. See how quickly and efficiently the thing has been arranged. Step by careful step, my murder has been skillfully planned. And now, can there be any doubt that it shall be flawlessly executed? <laughs> And he's only an amateur. And this is only his very first attempt. So it only goes to prove that each of us has a hidden facet, an unknown talent, an ability that's kept secret even from ourselves. Does this mean that murderers are born, not made? Or does it prove that murderers are made, not born? Whatever it means, someone is going to be killed just as soon as I return with Act Three. The order of the act has been schemed and plotted. And nothing can avert the final curtain's fall. Or so said a Russian poet. And certainly it must be said that not only has Sir Arthur's scheming been careful, skillful, and flawless, we can even add a bonus word and say meticulous. And so the deadly aconitine waits with fateful readiness the very next headache of the Lady Clementine Beecham. While I, of course, have made myself perfectly comfortable and happy in Vienna, a delightful, if somewhat socially backward city. And since I had announced to my beloved Sybil that I was here to consult a celebrated doctor, I decided, for the sake of the record, to do so. Headaches? Uh, yes, doctor. Fierce, relentless headaches. Uh, once or twice a month. Tell me about your dreams. Uh, dreams? I never dream. You never dream? Impossible. Yeah, well, it's true. I, I never had a dream in my life. <sighs> we have found it. Found what, Doctor? The cause of your headaches. You have the headaches because you do not dream. So, all the bad thoughts are still imprisoned inside the skull. You see? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. By George, there might have been something to what the fellow said. Lately, I noticed I had been starting to get headaches. Maybe the Saxon curse had come down to me. But this lack of dreaming... Well, all this was of minor concern. The crucial thing was, I had made sure of my story. I had said I came here to consult a doctor. I had consulted a doctor. I could now see where the execution of the perfect crime required superb intelligence, which is perhaps why it is beyond the capabilities of the lower classes. However, my visit was to end abruptly. That evening, there was a telegram from Sybil. Aunt Clementine died suddenly. So, she had taken the poison. She was dead. And now... I must return at once, like the proper grieving nephew. I didn't pause to pack. I caught the night express to Paris and from thence the train to Love. The following morning, I was back in London. Oh, darling, you're home. Tell me, tell me everything. Where, where is poor Aunt Clem? In the hospital. The hospital? 
I, I thought I thought you said she was dead. She is quite dead. You see, she complained of a severe headache, and so she drank a glass of wine, and in just a few moments she she Yes. Well she seemed to be dead, but I couldn't be sure, and so I, I summoned James and Harris and Charles and they carried her downstairs to her motor car and we all rushed to the hospital. Ah. Oh. At the hospital, they, they they couldn't help her. Oh, no. She was quite dead by the time we arrived. Even Sir Matthew Reed himself was unable to Sir, bring... Sir Matthew? Sir, Sir Matthew? Matthew Reed. He, he was there? Of course. He's her personal physician. Well, what did he say, Sir Matthew? Oh, I remember quite distinctly what he said. If I didn't know young Arthur better, I'd suspect foul play. He said that? He smiled when he said that. Oh, dear Arthur, no one could possibly suspect you of doing the old girl in. Why, you were miles away at the time. Uh, yes, in Vienna. Did did he say anything else, Sir Matthew? Uh, no, Arthur. Well, but why are you so pale? What? Oh, uh, the diet. <laughs> uh, Viennese diet, it uh, must have... Uh, <clears throat> uh, did he uh, perform an autopsy? Ah! Oh. What a perfectly gruesome thing to say. Oh, I should hope not. Uh, you don't know that. Oh, my darling Arthur. You are upset. You're not yourself. I can see. Oh, I know how much poor Aunt Clem meant to you. She was dear to me also. Always giving me little gifts. Yes, uh, darling, um, I uh, I should like to, um, to rest. Of course, my dearest. Rest. You must be brave. One does not lose an Aunt Clem every day. Why was I frightened? I had been assured that all would go well. There would be no retribution, that the killing would be carefully, skillfully, flawlessly executed. It was, wasn't it? Why was I so apprehensive? Hodges had assured me. Hodges. I must see him again. I must hear it from his lips again. He must read my future again. He must tell me that I shall not be caught. I rushed to West Moon Street. Here now. What you pounding on the door for? Uh, I, I'm looking for Professor Podgers. Uh, Septimus Podgers. Is he in? Oh, yeah. He's in. Well, then why doesn't he answer? Well, sir, you asked, is he in? And he's in all right. But he ain't in there. He's in jail. In jail? Oh, yeah. They come and carted him off about a week ago. Jail? Yeah. He had a bit of a confidence game. He'd get people to do all sorts of things and swindle them out of their money. How much did he take you for? Well, kiss him goodbye. You'll never see it again. I knew it. I knew he was just a common charlatan and thief. But he had the gift. The gift of what? prophecy. But how did I know? Perhaps it was all designed to get me to murder my aunt so he could blackmail me for the rest of my life. What could I do now? I couldn't very well visit him in prison. Oh, yes, I poisoned Aunt Clem, thinking that the death of a very old lady would cause no suspicion. But I had reckoned without Sir Matthew Reed. Sir Matthew, the expert, the authority on poisons. Well, if he doesn't suspect, then, then I will be safe. But suppose he does suspect. Sir Matthew said, if I didn't know young Arthur better, I'd suspect foul play. But he smiled when he said it. Smiled? He must have meant it as a joke. Oh, does he or does he not suspect? Why didn't it occur to me that I would inherit Aunt Clem's entire estate? Oh, that could set tongues wagging. Did Sir Arthur perform an autopsy or didn't he? Does he intend to or doesn't he? How can I find out? I must find out. I'll corner him at the club. You'd think a French chef would know what to do with veal. I, I think it's the Italian chefs who specialize in veal, Sir Matthew. The French more or less concentrate on beef. <laughs> Comes of relying on coroners. Damn shame about your Aunt Clem. Uh, yes. Uh, what, um, what do you suppose was the uh, cause of her death? I don't know. I uh, can't be sure. Ah. 
Uh, do you um, contemplate doing an autopsy? A lady of that age? Well, she can die for any number of reasons. Resistance low, heart not too strong. Old people die because they simply give out. Yes, and uh, she uh, simply gave out. Hmm? That has been my initial diagnosis. However... <clears throat> uh, what is it, Sir Matthew? Uh, just talking to you has raised a rather interesting point. What did she die of, specifically? Well, well does, does it matter? In science, everything matters. That was a good idea of yours. Idea? What idea? That I perform an autopsy? I did. Uh, Sir Matthew, do you intend to perform an autopsy? I don't know. It, uh, it depends upon my schedule. If I have no surgery in the morning, I might just, and uh, then again, my boy, I never make plans. Did he know? Was he playing with me? Does a person who has been poisoned by a conatine show definite signs? Was this a game? If it was, then I have lost, for Mr. Pethel will certainly remember selling me... Or will he? <laughs> After all, they are the busiest chemists in London. Mr. Pestle always struck me as an absent-minded type. Well, only one way to find out. Oh, Lord Arthur. Ah, good day, Mr. Pestle. Um, I was wondering, um, I was wondering if you might suggest a remedy for, um, for the gout. The gout? <laughs> Aren't you rather young to be troubled by the gout, Lord <laughs> Well, yes, but uh, it runs in the family, so when it attacks me in my turn, I, I intend to be ready for it. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> we have here a stool, and one elevates one's foot. Ah, excellent. Yes, thank you. I I'll take it. Well, I'll have it sent, Lord Arthur. Ah, thank you so much. It's so good seeing you again. It's been a long, long time. Ah, uh, so it has. Oh, no, uh, Weren't you in here a fortnight past? Was I? Well, it seems to me you bought some, uh... Aconitine. Yes. For your Swedish chauffeur. Oh, no, 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 no. For your Norwegian Mastiff. It must have been a fortnight. Well, I could look it up. It must be very careful, you know, to record the dates of all poison purchases. <laughs> it's the law. A most commendable statute. Well... Good day, Mr. Pessel. I was lost. Lost. Only a miracle could save me. But the age of miracles is past, gone, vanished. I shall be charged with the murder of my aunt. I shall be tried, found guilty, and hanged. And my head, oh, my head. My poor head is splitting. Your Honor, I do not ask for mercy. I ask only for understanding. I killed my aunt to save my sister, my dearest twin sister, present living in Canada, in order that she should continue to perpetuate her. Oh, Arthur, Arthur, oh, darling, oh, 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 only, I only acted according to the command of fate. Arthur! I, Sybil, 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 what? How, how, how did you get Hastings in here? Hastings called I... me, said you were in a frightful uh... shape. Nightmares and whatnot. Oh, oh my head, my, my head is splitting. Poor boy, the Saxon curse. The Austrian doctor was of little help. Nothing can help. Oh, you must never say that. Here, drink some coffee. A hot cup of black coffee. No, no, I, I don't like coffee. Oh, it's black. I know, I put in plenty of sugar. Uh, it won't make me feel better. It will, I promise you. Here. Drink it. All right. Now. Now, isn't that delicious? Oh. Sybil. Sybil, I... I must make a confession. Oh, no, you're exciting yourself. I... I poisoned my Aunt Clem. Oh, you did nothing of the sort. I did. I gave her poison. Poor boy, you feel so badly about her death. You've been having nightmares. I tell you, I poisoned her. You did no such thing, and Sir Matthew can prove it. Sir Matthew? Of course. He performed an autopsy on poor Aunt Clem this morning. What? Death was due entirely to natural causes. That's... Oh, that... 
That's wonderful. I, I feel lightheaded, completely. Oh, did it work? The medicine worked. What medicine? Aunt Clementine's medicine in this little silver box. That, that box? That silver box? It's the box you gave her. Sib- did you? Did you? Which has the remedy, the American headache remedy. Sybil, no. Oh, how peaceful. Oh. How calm you look. Oh. It works. The remedy oh. works. Sybil. Sybil, you didn't. The day you left for Vienna, I told your aunt it was because of your headaches. And she said, well, my dear, take this American remedy he gave me for my headache. And I said, dear Aunt Clem, don't you need it? And she said, oh, I'm much too old to experiment with Americans. Just put a pinch of this powder in wine or coffee or tea. And so I did. And now you feel better, don't you? Oh, Uh, you must tell me the name of this remedy. I shall suggest it to all my friends. Arthur? Oh, I see. See, it even puts one to sleep. Oh, this is wonderful. You rest now, Arthur, darling. And I'll wait for you to wake up. As you might assume, she had a very long wait. Well... Whatever you want to say about Professor Podger's prediction, his three basic forecasts did come true. Lord Arthur lost a relative. He did go on a voyage. And there was a murder. Not that Sybil was ever tried for it. I'll be back shortly. Consider the word written. For centuries, we have heard it used in all sorts of mystical context. It is written in the stars. It is written in the wind. It is written in our fate. It is written in our palm. It is easily dismissed as the meanderings of the imagination, but certainly something must be written somewhere. There must be some sort of written plan. Else, how do you account for the fact that we human beings make the same mistakes over and over and over again? Our cast included Paul Hecht, Catherine Byers, Cork Benson, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You see it, too? See what? That face. That face. That face. Which is not mine. Oh, no, no. The face I see always instead of my own. My dear man, no. I, I see you. Only you. It, it was your face I described as I saw it. None other. Look again. Look in the glass again. Tell me what you see. Whose face is there? Why, yours, of course. Now tell me, whose, whose face do you see? His, only his, always his, always his, his, always his. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.